If you want to pass the GED science exam, you need to know what to study. When you have an understanding of what will be on the test, you can study more effectively. In this video, I'll tell you what you need to know about life sciences to score 145 on the GED science test and achieve your goal. This is the third video in a series where I'm going over what you need to know to pass the GED science exam. In the first video, I talked about the structure of the test, as well as some of the science practices that you need to be able to do well on the test. In the second video, we talked about some big life sciences topics, like cells, their structures and functions, as well as the human body. In this video, I'll be covering more life sciences content that you might see on the GED science test, specifically reproduction, heredity, and modern genetics. Since life sciences questions will make up about 40% of the GED science test, it's important that you know what to focus on so that you can be prepared. This video won't be a comprehensive guide to these topics, but I do hope it'll be a good starting place for you as you start to study. First, let's talk about reproduction and heredity. In the last video, we discussed how all living things are made of cells and that the primary functions of life are to grow and to reproduce. Today, we're gonna to focus on that second function, reproduction. Reproduction is the process by which organisms create new individuals of the same species. The parent organisms produce new organisms called offspring. There are two main categories of reproduction asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. In asexual reproduction, the parent organism produces an offspring that is identical to itself. There are a variety of methods of asexual reproduction, including some bacterial cells that split themselves in half into two new organisms, plants that grow smaller versions of themselves that can be split off into independent plants, and animals whose body parts, if severed, can grow into a whole new organism. Unlike asexual reproduction, sexual reproduction requires two parent organisms. In sexual reproduction, a sex cell from each parent combines to create an offspring with a mix of the characteristics of both parents. In humans and other species, the name of the male and female sex cells, respectively, are sperm and ova. The physical characteristics that I mentioned are called traits. The process of passing traits from parent to offspring through sexual reproduction is referred to as heredity. When the offspring has the same trait as a parent, they are said to have inherited that trait. One of the first people to study this idea of heredity in a scientific way was an Austrian monk named Gregor Mendel. In the 1800s, Mendel observed that some pea plants had the characteristics of their parent plants, while others did not. Mendel identified that some plants were purebred, that is, that they always produced offspring with their same traits. He designed an experiment where he crossed purebred tall plants with purebred short plants, and he found that all of the offspring of one tall and one short plant were all tall. However, in the second generation, or the offspring of those offspring, about three quarters of the offspring were tall, while one quarter of the offspring were short. Mendel repeated his experiments many times over a period of 10 years, and he looked at other traits as well, including the color of the flowers and the shape and size of the pea pods. Mendel determined that offspring get one factor to influence each trait from each parent. These factors are called genes. Different versions of a gene for each trait are called alleles. In the tall and short pea plant example, there are two different options for alleles one tall and one short. A purebred tall plant would have two of the same allele. We'll call it two capital T's for tall. A parent plant only gives one of its two genes to its offspring. But since both of the alleles of this parent plant are tall, it doesn't matter which one it passes down it will definitely give that tall gene to its offspring. The same is true for the purebred short plant. Both of its alleles are for shortness, we'll say to lowercase t's. So it's guaranteed to pass the shortness gene onto its offspring. We can model this relationship using a Punnett square like this, which shows the possible alleles from each parent and the possible combinations of those alleles in the offspring. When both parents are purebred, the trait will always show up the same in the offspring. But when we're crossing a purebred tall plant and a purebred short plant, something interesting happens. 
See that all the possible offspring would have this tall short allele combination where they're getting one tall allele from the tall parent and one short allele from the short parent. You might expect that one tall and one short would make a medium sized plant, but Mendel observed that all of the offspring of this type of pairing turned out to be tall. These kinds of plants with one tall allele and one short allele are said to be hybrids. What we can observe from Mendel's experiment is that some traits are dominant where others are recessive. That is, the genes for some traits will hide the expression of the genes for other traits. In this case, the gene for tallness is hiding the gene for shortness. The phenotype, or the physical expression of the trait, of tallness occurs with the genotype, or combination of alleles, of either capital T, capital T, or capital T, lowercase t. Okay, so here's where this gets even more interesting. I mentioned that Mendel's second generation of plants, or the offspring of the offspring, were about three quarters tall and one quarter short. Let's look at a Punnett square for the possible offspring of two hybrid parents. See that one option is that the offspring will get one tall allele from each hybrid parent. So this offspring will definitely be tall. These two spots in the Punnett square will get one tall allele and one short allele. So those offspring will be genotypically hybrid, but phenotypically they will also be tall. So three out of four of the combinations of alleles have the physical trait of tallness. This last spot though will get two short alleles. So this plant would be short. So even though both parents were phenotypically tall, the expression of shortness re-emerges because the short gene was kind of hiding recessively in the hybrid parents. All right, so there are some traits that are controlled by one pair of alleles. A classic example in humans is whether or not your earlobe is attached to your face. It's very interesting to look at all of the ears in your family and try to see if there's some kind of pattern between who has an attached earlobe and who has a detached earlobe. But most traits are controlled by a variety of genes. So there's a spectrum of expression of the physical trait. People aren't just tall or short. There aren't just two colors of eyes or two types of hair or anything like that. Still, you might notice that in your family there are some physical traits that are very strongly inherited and some physical traits that seem to skip a generation or two only to reemerge down the line. The study of genetics has come a long way since Gregor Mendel's pea plant experiments. Now we know that genetic material is contained in chromosomes, or rod-shaped structures that are housed in the nucleus of the cell. All of the cells of a species have the same number of chromosomes except for the sex cells, which have half of the number of chromosomes. When two sex cells combine during sexual reproduction, the chromosomes combine to have the correct number for the species. Human cells contain 46 chromosomes, and human sex cells contain 23 chromosomes. Inside the chromosomes are strands of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. DNA is in the shape of a double helix, kind of like a spiral staircase. The sides of the staircase are made up of phosphate and deoxyribose, a sugar. And the rungs of the ladder are pairs of nitrogen bases called adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. The adenine bases always pair with the thymine bases, and the guanine bases always pair with the cytosine bases. The order of these pairs of bases contains instructions that the cell uses to make proteins, which controls both the structure and function of the cell. The order of these bases is called the genetic code. Messenger ribonucleic acid, known as mRNA, transmits this code to the cell's ribosomes to make proteins. Each set of three base pairs is called a codon, and each codon is the instructions to form a specific amino acid, or building block for protein. The human genome, or all of the genetic code that's contained in a human cell, consists of approximately 3 billion base pairs of DNA across 23 chromosomes. 
By mapping all the base pairs that make up the human genome, scientists have been able to identify genes that are responsible for hereditary diseases like cystic fibrosis, as well as genes that influence an individual's likelihood of cancer. This has enabled the development of genetic testing that has allowed for preventative or early stage treatment of many diseases. In recent years, gene editing technology has progressed to introduce the possibility that previously untreatable diseases could be treated. Genetic engineering has also enabled the increased production of important medications like insulin. Furthermore, genetic modifications have been used to create food plants with more desirable characteristics. For example, there are genetically engineered potatoes that are more resistant to pests and viruses. And there are genetically engineered apples that do not become brown as soon after being cut. Notably, recent vaccinations have been developed using mRNA technology to teach immune cells to create antibodies to fight against pathogens they have not been exposed to. Of course, genetic engineering is not without controversy. The benefits of genetically modified foods and mRNA vaccines are both hotly contested topics. Research into gene therapies which involve making edits to the body's genetic code in order to treat disease introduces ethical questions surrounding the good and bad uses of those technologies. As these technologies are relatively new and still developing, the conversations surrounding the ethics and boundaries of their use are still ongoing. Okay, so that was a brief overview of reproduction, heredity, and modern genetics that you'll need to be familiar with to do well on the GED science test. Of course, there is a lot more to know about these topics, so please consider this video as either a quick refresher or as a starting point for more study. I definitely recommend that you pick up a GED prep manual so that you can try practice questions and passages like the ones that you'll see on the test. I always recommend the Kaplan version, which I used to create this video and which I will link for you below if you'd like to check it out. You could also always use whatever GED prep manual that your local library has available to borrow. I also recommend that you use any free online resources that are available, especially if it's been a long time since your last biology class. I'll link some great resources from Khan Academy and Crash Course below. In making these videos, I've had the opportunity to go through some new resources from Khan Academy. They have a middle school biology course that's actually the exact level of detail that you're going to need just to be comfortable and familiar to pass the test. Again, we're not trying to memorize anything or go super in depth. You just want to be comfortable and confident with the basics so that when you read the passages, you're familiar with the vocabulary. On this channel, I make videos about how to study more effectively so that you can achieve your goals. In the coming weeks, I'll be discussing the rest of the content that's going to appear on the GED science test, including more life science, physical science, and earth and space science. So please subscribe if you'd like to learn more. If you're just starting to think about studying for the GED exams, check out my video about how to begin that process. Or if you're a little deeper in, check out my playlist on how to study for the other three GED subject tests. If this video was helpful for you, please press the like button so that YouTube knows this is a good resource for GED studiers. It's your support that allows me to take the time to make these free resources for you. So thank you as always for watching, and until next time, Happy studying.